Welcome to the Oddity Shop, where the bazaar is always on sale. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Pottity Shop. I almost said Pottity Shop. The The podcast called Oddity Shop. I know what we're doing. I'm still sick. This is Kara Perikovic. And I'm Zach. And we think we're cool enough to be your hosts. Do we, though? I mean, we've been doing this for like, what, 38 weeks? (laughs) Ew, I hate you. You're that freaking parent that you're like, how old is your child? (laughs) <laughs> 21 weeks 21 weeks i oh 21 actually, months 21 months right oh god could you imagine if they did it in weeks somebody out there does or has my child 137 weeks old ew i want to die uh, um anyways this isn't the podcast where we talk about babies this is the podcast where we talk about the odd the bizarre the strange and the haunted Creepy, unusual possessed <laughs> We're weird, and um, I already told Julia that if I ever die, she needs to clear my internet history because it has just been... You know, I was thinking about that the other day. This is, yeah, my search history is a little insane with all of the stuff that we have to look up. With that being said, sorry, just a quick tidbit reminder anything that you're interested in, uh, if you want to deep dive a little bit more on the topics that we cover, all of the... um, Websites and whatnot will be all of our references. That was the word will be linked in the show notes. So your history can look just as weird as ours. You can end up on all the same government lists. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Kara, what is new with you? Uh, Well, are you in Texas? Are you back from Texas? Uh, I'm back. I went at the end of May for training. It was really nice. (laughs) It was really hot. Um, I only spent a couple of days there. What? No, we're not lying to these people. No, we're pre-recording this. Uh, but when <laughs> you're listening to this, I will have gotten back from Texas, and I hope it's as great as it is in my head. <laughs> uh, well, because we're also pre-recording in two days, my brother and well, she is my sister-in-law, but they'll actually be having their wedding celebration. So I hope that that's also as equally as great and fun. And I have to give a speech in front of 300 people, and I don't know how that's going to go. But I'll update you. Oh, no. Oh, I wish I could be there just to see that. Oh, I'm sure mom will record it and send it to you. I might have, uh, what is it, chat GPT write, write, my, <laughs> write the speech for me. <laughs> oh, my God. Just because why not, you know? That would be uh, actually hilarious. Maybe I'll have it write some of it. Fair, fair. I know. Um, but yeah, that's really, I think that's all that we have. So on the fair enough thing, now that you've made fun of me so much on here, it's bleeding out. Mm. Three separate times I've said fair to somebody and they respond to me with fair enough. And <gasps> at least, at least it's a sign to me that people that are they listening listen? to our show. That's good. I love that. I, I kind of crack up a little bit every time. Maybe maybe it'll shame me out of saying it at one point. I mean, I, I like it. I don't want you to stop. It's just a catch-all phrase. Yeah. Anyways. Sure. You got a question? Uh, I do. You better. If you created something that led to multiple deaths, would you feel guilty? Okay. Mm-hmm. I know I took too long to start to answer, but yes, I would feel guilty. Unless the people who were dying deserved it. Mm, mm-hmm. Like... Okay. So that's why it took me a second, but I had to, like, I was trying to think of a situation in which, like, I invented something that led to the death of bad people. But also, would I still, like, should I have that power? Okay, I'm going to just go with yes. I would feel guilty no matter what. Yeah, I mean, I think you would, even if it was something that you weren't, it wasn't intended or it was, but it was for, like you said, people that deserved it. You'd feel guilty, I feel like, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah, I'd still lose some sleep. Are you ready? I am prepared. I'm ready. I'm ready. That always just makes me think of that AJR song now. No, it's Spongebob. Yeah, but they sam- Oh, oh no. I don't. I, I just shut up. I'm ready, Eddie. <laughs> okay. Go on. In 1855, it was known that Smith & Wesson firearms were having financial problems with one of their new patent arms. Oliver, a businessman, saw this as an opportunity. So he invested with stockholders and was able to obtain the Smith and Wesson Smith and Wesson division. Cut to 1857. 
He relocated to New Haven, Connecticut and became a principal stockholder. The name was then changed to New Haven Arms Company. Okay, to put this simply, what they had been working on and failing prior was to make a repeating gun, which they referred to as a volcanic repeating rifle. This would be so that after every shot, you didn't have to reload. Okay, cool. So the original design was better than having a single shotgun, but it was really sluggish and it wasn't reliable. Okay, side note. I do think about that in like old timey war. How mm-hmm. awkward it would be yeah. like if you took a shot at somebody and then you just had to stand there and reload yeah. and hope like you, you beat don't the die. other person to it. Yeah. Like, hold on a second, please. Horrifying. Y- yes. <laughs> it's just like the image is comical, but it's not actually. Okay. Anyway, Oliver gets engineer Benjamin Tyler Henry to improve this volcanic repeating rifle. Also, the name Benjamin always trips me up because people say it with an R in it, like Benjamin. You've never heard people say that, like Benjamin. And for my whole entire elementary, maybe middle school, I always thought the name was Benjamin, not Benjamin. Maybe it's less of how people say it, but more of your active listening skills. No, it's not. The redesign made for the frame and magazine larger to be larger, allowing for 17 of his newly designed all brass .44 caliber rimfire cartridges to fit. I have no clue what I'm saying, but it was revolutionary. Oh, you've never been, you've never really shot a gun, have you? Oh, I've shot guns. I just don't need to know what they're called. Fair. Enough. (laughs) <laughs> All right. So that's just a little gun information to start our journey. Perfect. I have a feeling if we're talking about guns, I might know where this is going. Today, we're diving into America's most haunted labyrinth. Yes. For those of you that don't know, a labyrinth is a complicated, irregular network of passages or paths in which it is difficult to find one's way. A maze, if you will. Side note, check out Labyrinth, the amazing 80s movie. The musical with the one and only David Bowie it is such a wonderful, wonderful movie. Oh, you're, you, no, you're going to hate me. You've never seen it. I've seen No. Clips. Goodbye. All right. Bye. America's most haunted labyrinth or more commonly known as the, the Winchester, Winchester Mystery House. Yes, let's go. So this house, if you will, is an architectural wonder and historic landmark in San Jose, California, according to WinchesterMysteryHouse.com. Uh, this is a place that Zach and I love and we're obsessed with, and it is top of our bucket list to visit one day, and we will do it. Oh, yeah, we're definitely going. Not like how we always say we're going places and then never go. We're actually going to do this one. No, we really are. And it's totally not that expensive to go like the tour and stuff, which I was kind of surprised. I don't know. I thought it, I thought it would be more anyway. Um, so obviously it's appropriate that one of us were going to cover this. And, uh, if you don't want to hear about it, I don't care because I'm doing it. (laughs) (laughs) Just turn it off now because Kara doesn't care. (laughs) Kara doesn't care. It's got a ring. It reminds me of Scotty don't know. Is that what it is? <laughs> Scotty doesn't know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Holy crap. Um, all right. So I am most definitely going to get into the house, but I want to go back and get into how we got to this architectural wonder and all the heartache that led to it. And first and foremost, that means we need to talk about Sarah Lockwood Party. Is it Party though? It's P-A-R-D-E. I think that's party. how she spelled Party. Party. Yep. Party. Yep. Okay. Sarah was born in 1839 in New Haven, Connecticut. I will just put in here that most articles say 1839, some say 1840, but it kind of does range from 1835 to 1845. Records weren't great. They weren't, but primarily it's like 1839 is what most people go with. So we'll just say with that. Um, She was a daughter of Sarah Burns and Leonard Party. And I hate the name Leonard. (laughs) <laughs> not because okay, it's a so bad let's name throw shade at dead people no it's just not that it's a bad name they're just a freaking weirdo that i went to high school with lenny i think we all have a couple names that were just like ruined for us yeah unless you're listening hey lenny <laughs> <laughs> okay anyway so sarah was fifth out of seven kids that's also one thing that in records is kind of like unclear of for sure where she fit for sure how many like you know what I mean? Was she Irish? Oh, no. What were they? 
I just imagine like lots of kids at that time. You have yeah. Well, I feel like at that time you were just there's a lot of kids. Anyway, um, Sarah's family was pretty well off. Her father managed the city bathing house before he founded success in Finnish carpentry. Which isn't that really wild to think that there's a city bathing house running water couldn't have been that popular in mid 1800s i know but can you just imagine like you want to go take a nice relaxing bath as you do a lot and you go to the bathing house you're just taking a bath with a few other people it's just human soup ew okay and then it's also said that um her dad owned a carriage manufacturing business that supplied ambulances to the union army during the civil war and then <laughs> All right. Uh, I keep losing my spot, so my bad. Okay. Sarah's father also was said to have run a progressive household and apparently met with prominent abolitionists and free thinkers. For those of you that are unfamiliar in abolition, abolitionists were people wanting to abolish slavery. So way to go, dad. You would do one things. So safe to say she grew up very privileged. She was well off, free thinking home, cool. I feel like that progressiveness has to play into... You just hold on to your butts. Okay. 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 Uh, At the age of 12, Sarah spoke Latin, French, Spanish, and Italian languages. She had a love for classics like Shakespeare, and she had a remarkable talent as a musician. So she's just like doing things. She was a child prodigy while we were child dumbasses. Uh, I was pretty smart. The lies you tell. On top of her intelligence, she was beautiful. Which I feel like you always, like when you're always like diving into stuff like this, I feel like that is one of the things that everyone's, not just on this story. I'm just saying like, she was so pretty. She was so beautiful. And I'm like. It's always right before they say they were the victim of something. Her I know. eyes lit up the whole room when she walked it's in. It's so bad, but that's so true. But anyway, the she really was. The New Haven Society dubbed her the Belle of New Haven. And I will say that Sarah wasn't just known for being smart and pretty. She was said to have a, the distinguishing characteristic, char- characteristic of not being ordinary. I don't know how to take that. Everybody loved her, so they they were saying it like like she she wasn't just a run in the mill. She stood out. Yeah, but doesn't it sound bad? <laughs> like you know when people are like, oh yeah, they're just kind of exotic looking, but it's just like a nice way of saying they're ugly. <laughs> That's not what they were saying here. But do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, I wouldn't say that. I feel like exotic looking has more racist undertones usually. Oh, but- maybe whatever. But a distinguishing charist, char, char, I can't say that word. Of Characteristic. Not, of not being ordinary. Okay. <laughs> Don't agree with me. It's fine. Okay. Growing up in New Haven brought a lot to Sarah's life and like her upbringing. Most importantly, it brought Yale University. Yale was said to have to be a hub of progression. Sarah was raised and educated in an environment ripe from ripe with Freemasonic and Rosicrucian philosophy. What was that second one? Rosicrucian. What is that? Okay. Would you let me finish? No. A Freemason is a member of a large society, secret society. Freemasons promise to help each other and use a system of secret signs in order to recognize each other. I feel like we kind of all know what that is. Right. But Rosicrucians were a member of a secret 17th and 18th century society devoted to the study of metaphysical, mystical, and alchemical. I can never say that word. Alchemical? Thank you. Lore. Ooh. Okay, so we got a lot going on here. Um, But you can just tell, like, the way she was raised. This kind of all makes sense that you would end up Oh, yeah. Mystical, progressive. Yeah. Not ordinary. Right. Speaks that's, Latin. Okay, I guess maybe that's why I was saying, like, not ordinary makes her sound like... Like a weird kid. Yeah. and yeah, I, don't, I, that's I know not, what you mean. Yeah, that's not what they meant, but, like, I didn't like that descriptor for her. Fair. <laughs> it had a little bit of shade. It, yeah. Okay, so early on, Sarah was admitted to Yale's only female scholastic institution, the Young Ladies Collegiate Institute. Because you have to remember at this time, females weren't... Like you weren't going to Yale. That was all that was male. Right. Male, yeah. you know. 
So they did have this society that was very limited and she was able to be admitted, which I think is like shows, you know, how smart Just she how was. smart. Mm -hmm. The cur curriculum was heavy in science and math. Um, and Yale exposed Sarah to a lot of influential professors. She had direct exposure to Delia Bacon. Delia was an American writer of plays and a Shakespeare scholar. So she was best known for her authorship of Shakespeare's plays. Delia also worked alongside Sir Francis Bacon, which they actually have no relation, just the same last name. Oh, that's weird. Right? So this led Sarah to the teachings of the Baconian Doctrine, which I'm throwing out so much stuff to you. You're saying some big words and I'm real proud. It's hard. <laughs> okay, so the Baconian Doctrine, um, which in short is... A methodical observation of facts as a means of studying and interpreting natural phenomena. It was said that the mixture of her love of Shakespeare and the Baconian doctrine led her down or led her to be drawn to the new theorem. <laughs> Your face is so funny right now. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to Yale. I know. I did, listen, this, this is a hard one. <laughs> but I really wanted you guys to understand how smart Sarah was. I mean, it is really cool because I know of Sarah, but I feel like I only ever hear... That she's crazy. Like right before the... Maybe a couple of years before the house. I've never heard of her backstory. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, back to so the new theorem. In mathematics, a theorem is a statement that has been proved or can be proved accord according to Wikipedia. Um, so that's... Oh, God, mathematical proofs. You were giving me I know. way too much PTSD. I really was going to deep dive a little bit more in some of these, but I was like, I can't do it. I just can't do it. She was also drawn to theosophy, which is teaching about God and the word and the word God in the world. Holy balls. I knew I was going to trip again. up this whole episode because there's so many fucking words and shit. Okay. Sarah was also drawn to theosophy, which is teaching about God and the world based on mystical insight in a nutshell. So we're studying. <laughs> I don't even remember. All, all, all kinds Can we just of say stuff. she studied the metaphysical? She studied everything. Okay. Okay. The theosophical perspective that she respected the most was of Rudolf Steiner. Steiner viewed the universe as a vast living organism in which all things are linked to individually involving units or cells that comprise a greater universal synergistic body that is ever building. Ever building is a key factor in Sarah's future. Ooh, I didn't even catch that at first. Yes. Yes. Side note. Mm -hmm. Stein okay, did I ever tell you I was a philosophy major for like two semesters? Oh yeah, but I forgot. I do too. Steiner is the shit that fucked me up. Oh dude. really? Like Steiner. Okay. Okay. So we have secret societies, mathematical equations. And numbered cipher systems mixed with delusions and metaphysical and mystical thinking. Like, this can only develop your mind into, like, so many different, like, worlds. It really puts a different perspective on her. I think it helps you understand. It does, because, like I kind of said, if you did know about the house more and, like, the things that you hear about is that she was, a lot is that she was crazy. Um, just... Whatever. But when you really learn about her, you're like, no, she was really intelligent and she was like fascinating. Like she was a fascinating woman. Oh, for sure. All right. So that's kind of all of the studies and the things that she was like into, which is a lot. I don't even know how she slept. So we're going to fast forward to 1857. Remember that seemingly useless information about Oliver moving to New Haven? <laughs> Oliver Fisher Winchester was an American businessman and a politician from Boston, Massachusetts. He started out as a clothing manufacturer in New York and Connecticut before investing into firearms. And then that's when Oliver Winchester moved, had a son with his wife, Jane, William Wirt Winchester. 
William was named after William Wirt, which was the longest serving attorney general in the United States, which I always feel like no shade to anybody. But like when you name your child after like an influential, influential person or like a really expensive product, it's like. Do you feel the most powerful and beautiful with the elements of the earth around you? Do you like one of a kind jewelry? Do you sometimes feel like a woodland fairy? Me too. That's why I created Holly and Hemlock, a magical shop filled with handmade wooden jewelry and metaphysical tools. Come check out our enchanting wooden wares at www.hollyhemlock.com and join us in honoring the magic and beauty of nature with each unique creation. That's www.hollyhemlock.com. Really? Who is it that named their kid after like a fashion line? Coco Chanel. It's uh, Sir Mix a lot, and what's her damn name? Yes. Ugh. Anyway, so. <laughs> Sorry. It's fine. Well, <laughs> my right? brain just. I know. Okay. William was born July 22nd, 1837. Uh, he was the only boy out of the three children. So at this point, when they moved, um, William is around 20 when they got to New Haven. So the Winchesters and the parties knew of each other's family from church. And William's sister, Annie, was actually also in the Young Ladies Collegiate Institute, which I feel like that's awesome, like, because like we just talked about, that was like a prestigious thing to be invited to that. Um, and it was really rare. So it's kind of cool that these are already, though, both like prestigious, like high society families. Yeah, I, you could say I that. mean, if both of their women are getting into Yale, yeah, I feel like yeah. part of that is the smarts, but part has to be the connection. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, that and yeah. Uh, okay, so William attended New Haven's Collegiate and Commercial Institute, which is essentially a sister program of Yale. And one of his instructors was one of Sarah's. And another one of his instructors was actually Sarah's cousin, who was like a free, I think he was like a Freemason and he did kind of stuff like that. So studying the same curriculum, essentially, having social and family connections made it almost impossible for them to not meet. Right. I wonder what their their cute meat was. Meat cute. What is it? Meat cute? Meat cute. What is that? Oh, my God. You've never heard of like, oh, my God, what was your meat cute? I hate that phrase. I do, too, but. Immediately hate it. <sighs> All right. Well, <laughs> I don't know what to say to you. Okay. We're moving past it. In 1862, Sarah and William were married on a hopefully wonderful September day. When would you get married? I don't think I've ever given the timeline thought. Okay. Uh, not the timeline. <laughs> I just mean like the like what month. Well, like the day, yeah. Okay. Four years later, their first child was born. So July 12th, 1866 brought Annie to the Winchester family. You know what's interesting about this is I know they ran in the same circles. And I know back in like the 1800s, Democrat and Republican, they weren't, they were different parties, but they weren't as split. But like. How does it metaphysical, progressive, marry, I'm naming my kid after the attorney general and building guns? Yeah, I mean, but he did have, he did pretty much study the same curriculum as her. Okay. So, yeah, but yeah, it is kind of all. And there really wasn't that much like life story background on William, like other than his dad invested in the Winchester gun, like, you know, or invested in right. Smith and Wesson and whatever. So. I really did want to have a little bit more deep dive on his background, too, but it, there just wasn't a lot out there. It was primarily Sarah, which is gotcha. fine. She's a badass. Um, okay, so sadly, Annie was diagnosed with um, marasmus. I hope I'm saying that right. But marasmus is a condition where the body can't metabolize proteins, making you malnourished. Mal Thank you. And 40 days after being born, Annie dies. Oh. So. Did you not know that? I feel like it sounds familiar, but... That's one of the main things that I think that people are like, she went crazy or like when she went yeah. mad is because she lost her child and she like dwelled in the loss of her child. And I'm like, well... I guess I just thought that was closer to... The house? The house, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But I just think that that's really... I mean, nowadays we know that there's no timeline for grieving. And if you lose a child, like... That has to be horrifying. Like, you spent 40 days with this child. And there's nothing you could have done. Right. So, yeah, this completely broke Sarah. 
like we just said, as you can imagine. Um, in 1873, the Winchester Model 73, or the gun that won the West, is released. This was the most successful gun for the Winchesters. It served in at least 24 wars. My God. I can't comprehend that there was, like, what? <laughs> There's a lot of wars going on. Yeah, if then. you... you like Wikipedia listed them all, and I was like, I've never even heard of any of these. I mean, I've heard of a lot of them, but the majority are like, what is this even? Which is just crazy. I feel like the wars were just smaller then. Yeah, but still, it's like, what? Um, so that kind of leads me back to my question was, if you invented something and it caused multiple deaths, would you feel guilty? Man, and they were just profiting. Well, yeah, and 24 freaking wars... That's a lot of deaths. I couldn't That's even find count. I couldn't even find any sort of statistic to see just how many deaths were caused from that cuz there's just no way to know. But yeah, yeah, I mean, we don't even have the record of the exact time people were born. You're not keeping it. Well, exactly. Um all right. So, now this is kind of where like if I were Sarah, this would kind of be my breaking point is Oliver Winchester died on December 10th, 1880 at the age of 70. This left the Winchester Repeating Arms Company to his only son. Sarah allegedly had a really great relationship with her father-in-law, so this absolutely broke her. And then in 1881, her mother dies. And I couldn't really find... That's incredible, though, to live to 70, I feel at like. That, in, in that time, yeah. In the 1800s. Oh, my gosh. It seems like she built just really strong connections she with did. the people. Well, I mean, how her. would you not? She's, like, freaking amazing. I mean, her vibe had to be, like... Like, her aura had to be just amazing she had to be a water sign she had to have that high empathy <laughs> oh my God. so like i said 1866 she unfortunately loses her daughter 18 18 yeah 1866 she loses her daughter 1881 then her mother dies so it is a time difference but you know between but her mother dies and then in 1881 so same year she loses her father-in-law and then <laughs> that's so sad March 7th, 1881, William Winchester dies of tuberculosis at the age of 43. Oh my gosh. So according to the truth about sarahwinchester.com, which is where I got a ton of this information, just if you guys are you know curious, this left Sarah with the inheritance of $20 million plus nearly 50% of the Winchester arms stock, which in turn earned her approximately $1,000 per day in royalties for the rest of her life, making her one of the wealthiest women in the world. That is unfathomable in today's mind. I didn't even look it up because it's a lot. It's a lot <laughs> even if you were to get that today. Truly. Yeah. I could live very comfortably off a thousand dollars a day. Right. And that, my little oddballs, is part one of the Winchester Mystery House. So <laughs> her husband died before the house started mm -hmm. he had nothing to do with it my knowledge of it you, like you think you know the story i did at least know that part i thought they started building it together yeah. but what i'm thinking is okay so stephen king's rose red is obviously based largely upon i've never watched that but there actually is a movie on her a movie it's called the winchesters not that really bad one that came out a few years ago right i think it is but i, I didn't watch it it was a terrible jump scare like yeah movie and, version of I was it. Like, it was this has nothing to do the with the worst thing i've ever yeah, seen i've never watched it so rose red though and it, it's been years since i've seen that so maybe that she started building her house after her husband died too but like you actually would love these movies okay. well it's a it was a mini series i think it's oh. like six or eight hours long okay um, but it's so loosely based on the Winchesters. Hmm. It's really good though. You'll have to check it out. But yes, obviously that was jam-packed through so much information. So yeah. I am going to give you a part two next week. So come back Ooh. and we'll actually dive in. <gasps> next week? Good out. Yeah, we skip you. <laughs> I get a break? Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. No, that was really good though. Cause like, I, I feel like it explains so much of. Listen, I'm. Here, I don't want to talk about what you're yeah, going to talk about next I'm week. I'm here for Sarah, and I, I am, I want to stick up for my girl, man. She wasn't crazy. No, no, she was highly educated yeah. and just into the, probably the same sort of shit we're into. Exactly. But also maybe a little bit crazy. Maybe fair. 
enough. I think it's enough. Ugh. Well, I guess we'll 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 come back to it. But like I said earlier, all of the stuff that she was getting into, and you have to imagine that if you're studying this, you're getting like you're like um like really honing in on it, and you're um the word I'm trying to like articulate isn't coming to me, but you're investing all of your time, your brain power, whatever, and your brain is going to go to a different world. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just with the stuff she studied, like exactly. you're definitely it going into the, the spirit world, mm -hmm. you know, the realm is it's not a big jump. That's interesting because I had no idea she went to Yale or was as highly educated. Like it really paints a different picture. I'm still interested, though, on in how progressive and I know gun gets together. All right. Well, I'm glad that I taught you some things you didn't know. <laughs> Absolutely. No, that was great. Good job. Okay, well, we'll see you back next week. Can't wait. Should we Should we wear our Winchester Mystery House sweaters while we're? Recording? I already planned it's on it, except 800 for degrees. I was thinking that I was actually going to wear it today, but I don't even have sleeves on and I'm sweating. Right, so yeah. I don't think next week we're going to be able to, but we'll pretend. All right, nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Okay. Well, if you enjoyed that, obviously stay tuned for next week. Kara's going again, I guess. <laughs> but in the meantime you know keep doing the things do you want to do the part two no <laughs> no you can do all that okay. research i want to hear it i know you do <laughs> like our stuff on social media subscribe Please. wherever you're listening to the podcast mm -hmm. uh tell me i'm pretty write in a story <laughs> don't make her you go any beggar nobody's done it yet <laughs> i just want one person to be like you're pretty just to see if they made it to the end you're pretty thank you um and most importantly, Kara. <gasps> Creep it real, you oddballs. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.